Okay, clip it anywhere. We got a okay, everyone, we are going to go ahead and get started <laughs> Boy, so we do not uh, run behind. That's great. So today will be the presentations of Mamelis' gang of four. Okay. Thank First you. up uh, is Tina Mamelis, who's a fourth-year medical stu student here at the U, um, and we'll be talking about FLIT1 and AMD. And so without further ado, Tina. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Conradi, for that wonderful introduction. I'm happy to be the first of the Mammalist gang this morning. Um, hopefully that doesn't echo too loud. All right, so this morning I'm gonna be talking about, I don't know how that, that may have worked. All right, so thank you for all for being here a little bit early. I'm gonna be talking about a new uh, serum soluble marker for AMD that we've been working on in the Embody Lab and we're pretty excited about. I'm gonna go through some background on soluble FLT1, go through the disease process a bit, talk about its implications as a possible serum soluble biomarker, and, uh, and then talk about its future implications that this may have on disease detection, early detection, and patient care. But before I get started with that, uh, us mammalai are very busy people, but we always have a chance to see a palace or castle. <laughs> so this wouldn't be a proper mammalist presentation without, of course, beginning with a palace. Uh, this is the Schönbrunn Palace in Vienna, Austria. I was there for ESCRS. Um, and uh, it's actually a German word. Schönbrunn stands for beautiful or lovely spring. Um, uh, not from the Greek, unfortunately, but I had to mention the German because that is the single culminating moment of my German undergraduate degree in 30 seconds. All right, by way of introduction, age-related macular degeneration is the number one cause of blindness in the population over 50 years old here in the U.S. Um, we know that approximately one out of every two of these patients with Drusen, as pictured in the, the top picture here, will progress to a wet or neovascular AMD picture here, seen below, within five years. We also know that VEGF, or vascular endothelial growth factor, plays an important role. I don't know why this is doing this. Um, an important role in the pathogenesis of AMD. What we haven't been able to really tease apart is, or really really characterize are any serum soluble biomarkers that may alert us to this progression from wet or from dry to wet AMD. And that's what I want to talk about today. So first of all, what is the role of S-Split in AMD? Um, we've been working for many, many years in the Embody Lab on characterizing what this biomarker actually does. And what SFLT is, is VEGF receptor one, or uh, it's an anti-angiogenic receptor, which essentially, maybe I'll step back. Okay, thanks. Which essentially traps and binds VEGF, which keeps it from um, going down its proangiogenic pathway. So we call this a VEGF trap, or something that actually prevents angiogenesis. Um, we know from previous studies that patients with neovascular AMD, thanks Brian, let me just turn it down. That one's off. Maybe I'll move it down. Maybe I talk too loud. Sorry, guys. Is that better? We also know that patients with neovascular AMD express less SFLT or S-FLT in the RPE. Just a few years ago, we did a study looking at the role of S-FLT actually in um, preventing blood vessel growth in AMD in animal models, and we were able to prove that SFLT1 is required in the RPE for vascular demarcation in an animal model. And when we did do a conditional knockout of this molecule in the RPE in our mice models, we did see a spontaneous chordal neovascularization develop. So this brings me to the study that I want to talk to you today about. Um, because we know that SFLT is decreased in the RPE, and we know some of the role that this is playing in vascular demarcation of the retina, we also know that S-split is found in the serum, and we propose that perhaps if we can measure the serum level of S-split, this may reflect 
the lower S foot level in the retina and may be able to alert us earlier to possible movement from dry to wet AMD. This is a study design, we took three population groups, one non-AMD, one early AMD, and one neovascular. As defined as young, or younger, I guess, males and females greater than the age of 65 years of age, um, the non-AMD group had to show no evidence of wet or dry AMD based on color grading of fundus images. The early AMD group was defined as per the Wisconsin grading system, but basically just having Drusen greater than 63 micrometers or pigmentary irregularities in at least one eye without any evidence of neovascularization in either eye. And the neovascular group had to show geographic atrophy greater than 175 microns in neovascularization for the, in that same eye. This is our patient number. I'm sorry, I got cut off here. 56, 53, and 97. We got these samples from a group working out of Queen's University in Belfast, Northern Ireland. They had drawn the serum studies um, for a previous uh, report, and we were, great, we were lucky enough to be able to get these samples um, from them. And from there, we did an ELISA, so immunoassay, looking to quantify S-split in all of these uh, different patient populations. We then analyzed our results with Excel and SPSS. And this is what we found, which we were very excited about. So not only were we able to see that there was a decreased concentration of serum S-split between, between the neovascular AMD group versus the non-AMD population, but there was also a difference between the S-split levels between the early AMD and neovascular AMD population. So essentially showing that as we progress from non-AMD eyes to an early AMD or dry picture to a neovascular AMD, the serum S-split concentration decreased significantly between all three of those populations. This image I thought was very interesting, and this is one that Dr. Uehara created from our data, showing essentially that the probability of development of neovascular AMD increases both with age, as you can see here, and with decreasing levels of S-split, as you can see here. We then decided to control for our known confounders, so sex, smoking history, and age. And even dis, uh, despite controlling for all of those, um, we found that for every increase by 10 points in S-split that we found, the odds of having neovascular AMD decreased by almost 30%. So that's to say that the more S-split you have, the significantly decreased risk of AMD you have. And finally, we decided to further characterize how this population um, specifically works with age and less S-split levels. Um, so serum soluble S-split at a concentration less than 80 picograms per mil was highly associated with neovascular AMD in a population specifically over 73 years of age. And um, most significantly, there was a six-fold odds ratio, so a six-fold risk of AMD in patients over the age of 73 with a decreased sol serum soluble S split. These results we published recently in the American Journal of Ophthalmology. And I wanted to compare very briefly this morning, how does this compare with other biomarkers that are known right now for AMD? They haven't really been characterized as fully as some of the genetic aspects and some of the other lifestyle aspects like smoking and age, but there is some work out there um, starting to look at other serum markers for AMD. And the three most well characterized other than our new S-split is um, first CRP, our C-reactive protein, which has been shown to show a two-fold likelihood increase of advancement from early to late AMD at, a, at an increased concentration. Eotaxin 2 and homocysteine, um, not showing odds ratios here, but did show uh, statistically significant increases in risk of AMD with increased levels of these uh, factors. So how do we compare our S-split to these other known um, markers of AMD? Well, our data showed not only a two-fold increase, but a six-fold increase at this higher age in pa patient population, um, and also showed similar statistical significance um, as these other two markers. Finally, we've been able to show that S-split fits in a pathway um, that we've sort of been drawing out over the last couple of years. And so these, we're not exactly sure what the role of CRP, eotaxin 2, and homocysteine may be. 
what role they play in the actual pathogenesis of Neovascular AMD, whereas S-split, we feel confident that we're really teasing that apart and may be able to confidently show association um, above the significance of these two markers here. So conclusions, what does this actually mean? Why is this actually relevant for us? First, we were able to demonstrate that S-split one was actually reflected, so the, the decrease of S-split one in the RPE that had been previously shown um, is actually reflected in the serum marker. So this gives us the opportunity to perhaps look at a systemic marker um, in order to fully detect, perhaps earlier predict and fully characterize people's disease risk for this uh, development of AMD. Secondly, um, serum soluble S foot one from patients with neovascular AMD is significantly decreased compared to both the early AMD patients and patients without AMD at all, which again able, enables us to possibly stratify patients in terms of their risk of development of AMD and risk of progression from wet to, uh, from dry to wet AMD. And finally, Serum split could possibly be a biomarker for the development of neovascular AMD. Um, now perhaps most importantly, what future studies have come from this? And I wanna be very clear, we, because this was a case control study where we're not able to fully characterize this association or demonstrate any sort of causality, um, all we've been able to do is show that there's a very strong association, which opens the door for a host of future studies and future directions that we want to look at based on this initial study. Um, first, we need to do a longitudinal prospective cohort study that follows patients as they develop AMD in real time in order to monitor their S-split levels um, as the disease progresses, not at one static point in time. This is gonna tell us whether the declining serum S-split levels is a reflection of the decrease of S-split in the retina or whether this perhaps heralds the onset of wet AMD, um, giving us the possibility of earlier detection in patients that are high risk um, finally, if we are able to establish this causality, perhaps restoring S-foot levels um, in the entire body or somehow systemically may improve our therapeutic options and targets within the eye, knowing that their decrease is reflected systemically. And lastly, we need to further explore the relationship between S-foot serum levels and the actual um, SNPs that Dr. Owen has uh, really studied in detail for the FLT gene in order to fully characterize what role S FLT is playing in this angiogenic pathway. I want to say a special thanks to Dr. Mbadi and Hiro Uehara, who are the masterminds behind this project, as always. Um, Ruth Hogg is our, our, um, our cohort over in Belfast, who gave, graciously gave us the samples to use for this study. Brian Stagg and Bonnie Archer for their help with the um, putting together this manuscript and of course uh, the entire Embody Lab for their continued support and teaching. These are my references and what questions do you all have? I'm aware of, but that would be a fantastic thing to look at, would be how to compare these to family members. Yeah, because we are looking at a very high risk population, and we know that this genetic component would make those family members high risk. That would be an excellent direction to look at. Thank you. Yeah. I think that's a great question. Um, and it is always important to kind of stay grounded into what, what this future implication of this work has. I think we can jump to conclusions and say, you know, oh, we might be able to create panels of serum biomarkers and things to establish which patients are at high risk. And I think that's kind of very far in the future. But initially, I think what these serum biomarkers are gonna do is gonna help us to um, further tease out what the pathogenesis underlying AMD is. And then once we're able to further understand what actually these biomarkers signify, then we can look at you know possibly doing a systemic detection or early detection um, system, possibly identifying patients who are at risk earlier and treating them better. Does that answer? Okay. 
Any other questions or comments? Okay. Thank you very much.